All right, folks, welcome back to the channel and to another Hickory Hacker course vlog. This week, we're going back in time to the 1840s to play another round of feathery golf, this time at Hillcrest Golf Course in Washington, Illinois. This is the home course of Denny and Kathy Lane, who are the proprietors of Hickory Lane Featheries. They host a really fun two-day event each April called the Oddball, where we play feathery on day one and gutty on day two. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But first, here's what's in the clutch, sponsored by Hickory Lane Feathery. I'm using the replica 1840s woods handcrafted for me by Brad Carando, an 1870 Robert Wilson Lofter, and then of course the Lane Feathery as my ball. Now the course we're playing today was laid out by Denny Lane in between the existing holes at Hillcrest. We're going to play a circuit of six holes twice for a total yardage of about 1,700 yards. And hole number one is about 125 yards. Here's one of my playing partners today. This is Dennis Olson. We'll talk about the clubs he's using here as we go. And then the aforementioned Brad Carando. He's joining me today using the set that he made for himself for the very first time. That was his very first swing with his 13 degree play club. And this was the second round that I was playing with the clubs Brad made for me. Not too bad for all three of us to get off the sand tee like that on the first hole. It was really special being able to watch Brad hit, hit his clubs, the ones that he made for himself the first time. I can't imagine the satisfaction you get from that experience. And I'm hoping that maybe this offseason I can work on a club with Brad and uh, kind of experience that for myself. So I mentioned that Denny Lane uh, kind of laid out this course for us. Uh, we could have played the regular executive course uh, layout here, the shorter holes and use the real greens, but Denny wanted to give us about as authentic experience as possible. So he actually mowed these greens that we're playing on. They run about one on the stimp meter um, and are very inconsistent as far as the role is concerned. So you're going to get a real good look at what it would be like to play feathery golf back in the day and um, how you really can't take any short putt for granted. Because with the feathery and that one ran pretty true, but you're going to see some that, yeah, right. you no know, problem. the ball just decides to go totally different nice direction six. than you expect. Anyway. So we're all taking our time even on these really short ones. See? And that right there is what happens. You know, not only does the feathery kind of get, you know, caught up in the grass, but the feathery itself isn't perfectly round. So you, um, yeah, like I said, can't take it for granted. You notice, too, that a lot of our shots, um, you know, we're using the ground to our advantage. Denny's kind of laid these greens out on the other side of some hills so we can kind of, you know, elevate the ball a little bit. But you're really trying to use the ground. Uh, that, that is kind of the ideal way to propel a feathery. Here I'm using the 22 degree Hugh Phillips short spoon. This is kind of the club I'm most comfortable teeing off with. So let's talk about the clubs that Dennis is using. If I remember right, he's using his play club and long nose replica putter from the Louisville Golf Gutty set that he has. I wish Louisville Golf still made that set, but they don't. A lot of guys picked it up though for Gutty Golf and use those clubs for their feathery rounds as well. Uh, that's pretty much what I'm going to aim to do uh, for people when I'm building the starter sets that I'm putting together for feathery golf right now. I've been sourcing a lot of splice neck woods, and if I can find them, long nose replica putters. Um, but in lieu of those, I'll probably just end up putting you know, a splice neck wood with a general iron at about 35 degrees or 40 degrees, and then a uh, smooth face putter if I can't find a long nose replica putter. Uh, and, you know, tell people they can use that for gutty golf as well. Uh, that's pretty much all you need to play feathery golf. Um, if you can't get the clubs that uh, Brad and I are using, if you can't make them yourself or find somebody to make them for you, it's the next best thing to enjoying the lane feathery, and they work pretty well. Back to the action. Short putt woes continue for me. There's a nice tap in for Brad, though. Hole number three is playing about 130 yards. Here's Brad using his 13 degree McEwen long spoon. Nice elevation with that shot. You know, like I said, pretty much any ball that's straight and bounds down the fairway will work with a feathery. 
Here I'm trying my hand with the 13 degree McEwen. Haven't had the you know best luck with that club off the Santee. Like I mentioned before, I've been using the 22 degree Philp more often. It's a nice strike from Dennis. It takes the hill down toward the green. When people ask me where they can play feathery, I usually tell them to look for a par three or executive course that set up well for beginners, which is to say wide open fairways, not a lot of places where you could lose the ball. Uh, if it's got a lot of hills and, and terrain to it, that's a lot of fun as well. If you go to the Hickory Lane website, Denny actually has a little tutorial on how to you know, set up your own feathery course in a large field if you've got access to one. But obviously, you could play feathery wherever you want. I had a lot of fun playing at Highland Links. Uh, I had a lot of fun playing at this course too because of how different it was from playing a modern course. You know, these greens, you know, it, it's uh, it's serious when you're playing. And and so I should talk about the oddball a little bit. So this first day we play feathery. We also play gutty, like a practice round of gutty golf on the actual golf course at Hillcrest. Here's number four. This is the longest hole we play, about 170 yards. But yeah, this is a nice warm-up to the 18-hole round of gutty that we play the next day at Metamora Fields. And I'll have that course vlog coming up on the channel later this summer. Here's a beauty from Brad. It's really tempting on a hole like this where you know you've got to cover a lot of ground to swing harder than you probably should. And it's nice that we play 12 holes in this event because the first six are basically you just trying to get acclimated to the swing you need to put on the feathery and especially the putts that you need to, to stroke on the greens. Uh, but the biggest thing is tempo. And you'll see on our second go around that our tempo got better and the striking was better as well. Dennis is already starting to figure that out, kind of using a much more even kind of swing rather than trying to kill the feathery you try to finesse it a little bit more and and get that sweet spot contact another thing i figured out as the round was going on here was that uh, if i choked up on the baffy spoon which is my 30 degree club the forgan baffing spoon i could get kind of a chip action kind of like that right there you could also use the putter for the same purpose. And I think the key with the putts is to basically pick a line exactly like that. That's <laughs> right on cue, Brad. Uh, I was going to say pick a line and hit it firm because if you give the, the feathery any chance to take whatever break or inconsistency there might be with the green, it's going to go all over the place on you. And that was a lucky putt there. But yeah, that putt from Brad was exactly what you need to do. All right, on to number five, 125 yards. This is probably my favorite hole of the layout. It's kind of fun teeing off right next to the road there, especially when we're in our feathery outfit. People kind of look and wonder what's going on. Had some people at the driving range look at us twice too. But also, that's obviously an opportunity then to talk to people about the history of the game and, and uh, why you're playing that with these clubs. So I had pretty good shots there. Here's the Forgan Baffing Spoon again. The, the flag is just gotcha. below a little hill on the other side of the green there, close to the fence. But this is a fun approach. If you, if you get this just right, that was pretty close. Just a little too much. Dennis had a great shot that came up short. I unfortunately didn't get that one on film. Yeah, there I tried to use the Brad technique of just picking a line and hitting it firm, but it didn't work out for me. Brad tried to finesse that one a little too much there, I think, and uh, went sideways on him. All right, number six, 140 yards. Interesting feature toward the green that you'll see on the second go around. Nice, nice, nice. Very nice. 
and we're starting to get the hang of it off the sand tee here. That's a great shot from Dennis. Just missing it. Oh, yeah. Just missing the sweet spot, yeah. Swung a little too hard on that one. Still got it out there, though. Okay. Very nice. Yeah, That's right the you. ticket right there. Brad's getting really nice elevation with the 13 degree club. It's kind of night and day between his experience with that club and mine. Way more comfortable with the 22 Philp short spoon. That was a tougher lie too. Yeah. Anytime you're in a situation where you've got thicker wow. grass or a tuft of grass to oh. navigate or your ball's in a divot, yeah, you tagged it's that. not easy hitting the ball with that, uh, with the woods and it, it's helpful to have an iron. They would have had an iron back in the day as well for those kinds of situations to, you know, kind of like a rut iron to extract the ball out of tough lies. And uh, you still need one of those today, in my opinion, too. There's a great putt from Dennis. I think technically that putt counted. Some, some of these flags were a little tight to the cup, so if you didn't, you know, tap it in slow, they didn't stay. All right, so let's wrap up the first circuit of six. Pretty much six is all the way across. 36 for my six-hole score. Let's see how we can do on the second go-around. You remember from Highland Links, my six hole score there out of the nine holes was 33. So not too far off my average. Not much of an average yet. Only had two rounds under my belt, but we're making one. One of the things that's already better for us in the second go around is we know where the green is. We actually thought the green was to the right and behind the actual green when it was actually to the left. So we're, we put ourselves in better position off the tee the second go around. I think that might work. Wish I'd gotten this shot from Brad, the full shot, but that's a really nice chip. He may have used his putter for that, actually. Now, getting back to the iron that you can use, I think that the ideal iron with the feathery set is probably something in the 35 to 40 degree range because that's got the loft to help you get out of tight lies, or not tight lies, but tougher lies. Uh, the lofter that I'm using, the Robert Wilson lofter, is in the right loft range, but it's just not set up great for what I want to try to use that club for. It is more of a kind of rescue club, like a, a, tr a rut iron would have been. So the sweet spot is pretty small on it, and uh, it's not a forgiving club at all, as you saw in the Highland Lynx round. That was kind of a rough shot there off the tee. Got me over in this interesting side area. Fortunately, that one popped through the trees okay. And Brad shows you here that you can actually get elevation with the feathery club if you want to do it. through. That was impressive, seriously. So you're seeing a little bit more of the course than we showed you the first go around with the errant shots. That's the cool thing though about playing a course that's as wide open as Hillcrest is here is you can find yourself into some, you know, interesting situations and really test your your skill with the feathery club and the feathery ball.
Yeah, back to the sand iron I'm using. Um, it actually is a sand iron. So the museum I went to is at the Foxburg Country Club. You're going to see that uh, that course vlog later in the summer from the National Hickory Championship. But in their museum at the, at the Foxburg Clubhouse is a 1820s, I believe, sand iron. And uh, I found a club that looks like it, not quite as heavy as that would have been, but uh, the shape of the head is similar and the loft is similar. So I've, I've put that in the bag and replaced the Robert Wilson lofter for now. And you'll see that in uh, course logs to come. That's probably my best shot of the round with the 22 degree Phillips short spoon off the Santee. Pretty happy with that. Oh, yeah. That should work well. Yeah, Brad was really enjoying this round with his clubs for good reason. Get over that hill. Get over. He was get, hitting some good shots, and then, like I said earlier, hitting good shots with clubs that you made yourself probably doesn't get any better than that. putt from Dennis. We haven't talked much about the putter in this round yet. The Tom Morris putter that I'm using right here is different than the one that I used at Highland Links. That was a temporary placeholder while Brad finished this putter that I'm using right now, which is made out of ash and has a much heavier swing weight to it than that other Tom Morris putter, uh, which is closer to what an authentic Tom Morris putter would have played like, according to Elmer Nahum. Oh, you got it. There's another nice shot there, if I do say so myself. Yeah, I kind of have a pattern where I hit a real nice shot. And then the next shot, I get overconfident and try to hit it harder than I should to see if I can hit it a little further. And that usually never works. And I found too that uh, after this round, Certain shots where I was using the fork and baffing spoon, which is 30 degrees, uh, sometimes it was just easier, or it is just easier, to use the uh, Tom Morris putter, choke down on it a little bit, and then basically hit kind of a punch chip, um, especially if you've got some ground to cover. That shot has been easier for me to control than using the baffing spoon. But I do want to show you at some point a very fun video uh, that Elmer Nahum shot when he was in Scotland. He was in a bunker and used, I'm guessing, probably a similar 30 degree club to get out of a bunker. One of the high-lipped Scottish style pot bunkers. And uh, it was a thing of beauty. Elmer's a great golfer. Uh, but what he did with that feathery club was amazing, in my opinion, and I have to try to see if I can find the video of that and put it in a future feathery course vlog so you can see that. I may just try to link to it in the description to his Instagram so you can see it there. It's going to work, though. coming at the green from a different angle than I was on the first go around. That's a pretty good approach too. I was thinking to myself right before this putt, I don't really have a great highlight from this round yet for the video. 
I wonder if I can pull it out here. Oh, he yes. And I did. Not to be outdone. Yeah! <laughs> I tell you what, hitting a putt like that, knowing how difficult it is, I mean, it might have only been a five or six footer, but it really felt like I accomplished something there. So we're riding high going into the final hole. Haven't been over on the left side of this fairway yet. That'll be an interesting approach. And Dennis finishes off the tee on a high note. Using the fork and baffing spoon here, hoping to kind of get it over the actual green on this hole. Get under it just a little bit. And it got caught up in this little area. I mentioned an interesting feature in front of the green. You're going to see that here in a second. Yes, it was. Nice, nice shot. Yeah. So that interesting feature is the actual real green next to our green. There's a little hill here, and I found the ball above my feet. So that was a tricky shot, but the baffing spoon worked pretty well for it. And we're all pretty close to the cup here to wrap up our round. Brad almost holed out there. It's the way you want to finish a feathery round where you just have to tap it in. Then he gets his close for a tap. I'm a little further away from tap in range, but managed to drain it nonetheless. So that'll wrap up this second episode of American Feathery. Thanks for watching, folks. Hope you enjoyed it. I finished up the second circuit of six with a 28 to a uh, nice improvement over the first circuit of 36 for a total of 64. And here's a look at my six, nine, and 12 hole averages on the season. And just in case you were wondering, this is a scorecard, actual scorecard from Musselboro, December 2nd, 1820, an event won by Mr. Cundle with an 84. They played two rounds of five holes there. So I'm feeling pretty good about my 64 on 12 holes, though I don't know what the yardage was on that Musselboro round. I have to look that up. Big thanks to Denny and Kathy Lane for putting on the event. It's a fantastic weekend of pre-1900 Hickory Golf, and you should definitely be here to enjoy it with us as well. For latest information on this event and all other Hickory Golf events in the country and the world for that matter, make sure you check hickorygolfers.com, which is the Society of Hickory Golfers website. All right, folks, that'll do it for this week. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. I'll be back next week with another video. In the meantime, here's one from the archive for you to check out. Take care, folks. See you next time.